Okay, so in this video, we'll be discussing um, paper one, okay, from October, November 2023, paper one, two. Okay, so we'll start with question number one. Um, it is given that the coefficient of x power three in the expansion of this is actually six times the coefficient of x squared in the other expansion here. So they want us to find the value of the constant a. Okay, so uh, just uh, recall the general formula for the expansion for the binomial expansion, right? The general formula, it should be NCR. Then you're having the term in front. So I put it as A, the term in front and also the term at the back. So the term at the back, we're having the power R. So the term in front will be having N minus R. So this is a general formula for any particular term for binomial expansion, right? Okay, so we can start from the very first bracket first. We are having the first bracket, which is 3 plus 2ax power 5. And we are actually interested only for the coefficient of x power 3, which means that I'm, I'm having nc something, then 3 power something, then 2ax power something. And to make sure that I will get a x power 3, right, in my expansion, I can fix the power for this one first. So 2ax, if I want to have anything with power 3, which means I need to put a power 3 here, right? So I'm having 5c3. ncr, b power r. So this is what I have here. And what is the power for the 3? So you take 5 minus 3, you get a 2. So it will be something like this. Okay, then try to expand it. You are having 720a power 3, x power 3. Okay, and after that, we are having the second binomial expansion, which is this one. And for this second bracket here, we are interested to um, get the coefficient for the x squared. So again, I'm having 6c something, the term in front power something, the term at the back power something. So I need to decide the power at the back first, right? So I'm having, um, I, I'm interested for x squared. So to make sure that I got x squared, that means the term at the back, I need to have a square with me. So I'm having 6c2 here, we will follow the power here. Okay, and then for the power of 2, you have to take 6 minus 2, where it is a power of 4. Okay, so this is how we try to set up the question. And after that, we are having 240a power 2 and then x power 2. So don't forget that for all the power here, right, you need to actually put it into all the term inside. Okay, so you have a squared and x squared and so on. Alright, and now we want to get the value for a. Okay, so we will focus on the coefficient of x power 3. So coefficient of x power 3 means that the uh, expression in front of x power 3 only, this is what we call as coefficient, right? And then the coefficient of x squared is this one, this whole thing. And here they actually tell us that the coefficient of x power 3 is the 6 times of the coefficient of x squared, right? So coefficient of x power 3 is this one, 720a power 3 equals to 6 times. So I have to multiply with 6 for the coefficient of x squared. So 240a squared. Alright, so from here, you just try to simplify this whole equation. Basically, you will get the answer for the a, which is actually equals to 2. Okay, so for this question, please make sure that you know how to expand the binomial expansion correctly. Just focus on your the power of x that you are interested in. Right. Okay, so this is how we solve question number one. Okay, so question number two. They want us to find the exact solution for the equation given like this. Okay, so to get the value of x in this equation, uh, I need to try and get the value for cos inverse square 3 over 2 first. Okay, so I copy everything on the right hand side. Then negative cos inverse square 3 over 2, right? If you press calculator to help you, you will get a... 30 degree okay so you'll get a 30 degree but of course when we want to solve this solution we solve the solution we actually need to uh, put our answer in radian form because all these are in radian right okay yeah so you try to convert 30 degree become radian so you are taking 30 multiply with pi divided by 180 so you get pi over 6 so by right, this answer should be negative pi over 6 uh, for cos inverse square root 3 over 2. 
So you can always use the calculator to help you. Right? Okay. Then to get the value of x, of course, I need to move all the other thing to the other side. So move this negative, uh, sorry, move this pi over 6 over, I'm having negative 2 pi over 6 in total. So after I simplify, I'm having, I'm having this negative pi over 3. Then to get the 4x, I want to find out tangent negative pi over 3. So again, you can use calculator to help you. Okay, so if let's say uh, you don't want to use calculator to help you, then maybe you need to consider the triangle. Okay, in the fourth quadrant. What is, why is it triangle in the fourth quadrant? It is because of I having the angle negative pi over 3. So negative pi over 3 means we measure it in clockwise direction. Then this angle is negative pi over 3, which is 60 degree. So this is actually 30 degree, right? Okay, so for pi over 6, I know that sine 30 degree is equal to 1 over 2. Therefore, I'm having 1 here. This is 2. And this is negative square root 3. Because according to this quadrant, you can see that the y value should be a negative value. Alright, the triangle is below the x axis. So the length here will be uh, negative square root 3. And when I'm looking for tangent negative pi over 3, so as a value for tangent, so tangent will be opposite over adjacent, right? Okay, so your 4x, what do you get is you'll get negative square root 3 over 1. Eventually, to get the value of x, what should you have is negative square root 3 divided by 4. Okay, so some students will ask, uh, uh, for tangent inverse, uh, sorry, for tangent negative pi over 3, right, can you just directly press the calculator to get the answer or not? Okay, so the answer is yes, but for some model of calculator, such as M, uh, such as the 570MS calculator, right, uh, you might not be able to get your answer in exact solution. So if you want to get the answer in exact solution, you need to have some very basic knowledge uh, on all the ratio of the three goal. Alright, so like for this one, okay, the triangle, by using the ratio of the triangle and also the trigo, okay, I actually can get the answer in exact form, which is negative square root 3 divided by 1. If you are using MS calculator, your calculator might not directly give you the answer in exact solution, right? So that's the reason why sometimes we need the triangle to help us, okay? Yeah, so this is how we solve question number. All right, so now we are at question number 3. Um, it is given the dy dx are equals to this equation. Then they, they are telling us that the curve passed through the point P to 8. They want us to find the equation of the normal to the curve at the point P. Okay, so first of all, uh, to find the equation of normal, I need the gradient of normal. Before I find the gradient of normal, I need to find the gradient of tangent first. Okay, so to find the gradient of tangent, I can use the dy dx. Huh? At point P, at point P means that you substitute your x equals to 2, okay, into the dy dx to get the gradient of tangent first. So you're having 1 over 2, multiply with a 2, plus 72 over 2 power 4. Okay, so if you try to simplify this particular value, you have 11 over 2. And you have to know that for dy dx, with this value, right, dy dx actually also means it is a gradient of tangent of the curve at the point P. Gradient of tangent. Okay, but now we are interested for the equation of the normal, right? So to get the gradient of normal, basically you need to know another simple rule here where you should know that the gradient of normal multiplied with the gradient of tangent should be equal to what? Should be equal to negative 1. Why is it equals to negative 1? Because of normal and tangent are perpendicular to each other. So we are having the rules where the gradient of normal multiplied with gradient of tangent equals to negative 1. And substitute in the gradient of tangent that you get. Your gradient of normal will be negative 2 over 11. Okay? Yeah, so after you get the gradient of normal, then you want to form the equation, right? So to form the equation, you need two information. The first one will be the gradient of the particular point and also, oh sorry, or the particular line and also the passing point that uh, the line pass through the passing point. 
Okay, so I, I have the passing point here, which is a P, point P. And then I have the gradient for the line also, which is negative 2 over 11. So from here, I can start to form the equation of normal. Right, so equation of normal. will be y minus y1 so y minus 8 equals to m x minus x1 so x minus 2 all right so for this particular equation you try to simplify everything and put it in y equals to mx plus c form so you're having negative 11 uh, 2 over 11 x plus 92 over 11 so this is how we found the equation of the normal to the curve at point P. Alright, and next one, part B, they want us to find the equation of the curve. Right, uh, in this question, we are given dy dx. So from dy dx, if I want to go and get for the y, this process we need to go through with integration. Alright, so that means to get the equation, which is the y, uh, you need to integrate the dy dx. Right, so we'll start now. To get the y, I need to integrate the dy dx. So integrate, I start to put the integration sign. So the dy dx will be half x. Then plus 72, I will put it as x power negative 4. Okay, so y, to get the y, you need to integrate dy dx. So this is a dy dx equation. Alright, so integrate half x. Half is a constant, you just copy. So integrate the x, uh, you will have x squared, then divided by 2, divided by the power. For the 72, also the same thing, you copy the 72. x power negative 4, power plus 1 become negative 3, so you divide it by the new power negative 3. Then after the integration, you need to put a constant term at the back, which is a plus c. Okay, then of course this is not my final answer yet, I need, still need to find out the value of c. Okay, so before I find the value of c, I try to simplify it first. So that my equation looks uh, more simple. Okay, then how can I find the value of C? Since they already tell us that P is a passing point through the curve, right? So you can substitute the coordinate of P. So at the point P, where your X is a 2, your Y is 8, substitute it into the answer that you get. So 8 equals to half. 2 square minus 24 over 2 power 3 plus c this after this step you will get the c equals to 10 okay so to show the examiner the final answer for the equation rewrite your answer again where y equals to 1 over 4 x squared minus 24 over x power 3 plus 10 okay so this is how we get the equation of the curve lah, from dy dx. So basically, you need to involve integration technique. Right, so this is how we solve question number three. Okay, so question number four, the diagram show the shape of a coin. So this is a coin that we have. And then there are three arcs, A, B, B, C, and C, A, are parts of the circle with the center C, A, and B respectively. All right, so maybe um before we continue, right, you should know that uh, when we're having the arc A, B, basically it is the arc from the center C. So that's the meaning. Okay. So if let's say it's from the center C, you know that the length C A, right? Not the arc, uh, the length C A, straight line C A is a 2. Because it should be the C is a center, uh, right? So you should be you should have the radius. Uh, C A is the radius and also C B is also the radius, which are 2. Okay, each of them are 2. Then same thing happened for the arc A C. So if let's say I'm having the arc A C, basically it is come from the circle with the center B. Okay, so from here also you know that this line is also a 2. Okay, then the same thing happened for the arc BC. So it is from the center A. Okay, so all the three arc here basically are from the um, circle with the center C, B, C, A and B respectively. And then now they really tell you that the triangle ABC is an equilateral triangle with all the sides length 2 cm. Okay, so from here, you also need to take note that uh, the length for all the A, B, and C should be the same because all of them are, have, are actually the length from the center with a radius 2 cm. 
So all of them are having the same characteristic here, right? So which means that now you should know that the length for AB, the length for CB, R, and also the length for CA, basically they should be the same. All right, because all of them are actually from a circle with the center 2cm. Okay, then now they want us to find the perimeter of the coin. So to find the perimeter of the coin, I maybe need to find out one of the length of the arc here. Then I multiply with 3 lah, because all the other two arcs are, are having the same length. So to calculate the length of the arc, basically it is R theta, right? So to get the AB, you're having R. And then what's the theta here? I need to know the theta. Okay, so since we know that the triangle ABC are all same size, same length, which is 2, 2, 2 cm. So when you're having an equilateral triangle, the angle inside the triangle should be 60 degree, which is part uh, pi over 3. Right, so to answer the first part of the question, to calculate the perimeter, what am I going to do is, I'm going to perimeter. Okay, so I'm going to take three times of the, uh, of the arc length. Alright, so three times r theta. Okay, so three is a three. Lah. And then what is the r? r is two, right? The radius is two. What is the theta? It will be pi over three. So if you try to simplify your calculation here, basically you are having 2 pi. So that means all the parameter of this uh, coin okay, is equals to 2 pi. Alright? Yeah, so this is how we answer part number A. Then after that, we are going to part number B. So for part number B, they want us to find the area of the face ABC of the coin giving the answer in terms of pi and also sub 3. Okay, so now we want to find the area. Before you find the area, maybe you try to do a little bit of analysis first. Uh, a little bit of planning. Lah, okay, so to find the area, maybe what I can do is like I try to find out the area of a sector first. So like this one, red color one. Okay, so after I find the area of the sector, then I add them together with the area of these two segments. Again, these two segments are having the same area. Okay, like what I told you just now, because everything is from the circle with a center 2cm, right? Or with a radius 2cm. Therefore, these two segments basically is the same as well. Alright, so this is what we plan to find out the area. So to find out the area of the ABC. Okay, so I find out the area of sector. Okay, so to find the area of sector is very straightforward. You'll be half r square theta. So your r is a the angle inside the equilateral triangle, right? It should be pi over three, which is sixty degree. So theta will be pi over three here. Okay, then next, I have to add two times of area of segment. So to get the area of segment, so you try to imagine, basically it is taking area of sector minus the triangle. So area of sector minus the triangle, then you will get the area of segment. Okay? That will be half, again, R square theta minus the area of triangle so i want to use a b sin c formula half a b which is also two times two square then sin c which is sine pi over three okay then now you can slowly simplify your answer so for the first term here you should have two uh, over three pi for the first term for the second term here you should have four over three pi Okay, then for the last term here, you should get then the value of sine pi over 3. Sine pi over 3 should be square root 3 over 2, which is sine 60 degree. Okay, so again, if let's say you your calculator not able to give you the triangle, uh, sorry, not able to give you the exact value in sub 3, then basically again, you need to try to draw the triangle for yourself. Lah. 
Right, so if let's say I'm having 30 degree, sine 30 degree is 1, 2. So this is square root 3. Now they're asking for sine pi over 3, which is sine 60 degree. So it'll be square root 3 over 2. So this is how I get the square root 3 over 2 here. Okay, then I try to simplify all the terms in my solution here. I will have 2i, then minus 2 square root 3. Okay, so you can see very clearly that this is how we keep our answer in terms of pi and also sub 3. Okay, so again, for this part, the sub 3 over 2, if let's say you are using MS calculator, your calculator might not be able to give you the exact value straight away, then you might need to use the triangle to help you. Alright, yeah, so this is how we solve question number 4. Okay, question number 5. We are given the first, second, and third terms of geometric progression. So, highlight the keyword geometric progression. First term is sine theta, second term is cos theta, third term is this one, 2 minus sine theta. Uh, and then they are telling you that the theta is in radian and it is an acute angle. So, first they want you to find the value of theta. Okay, when we are having the geometric progression, we know that the common ratio should be second term divided by the first one and also equals to the third term divided by the second one. So that's a common ratio, right? So now I'm going to use this result, yeah? Okay, so I use the second term divided by the first term. So cos theta divided by the sine theta equals to third term divided by the second term. So the third one will be 2 minus sine theta divided by cos. Okay, so this is a characteristic for the geometric progression uh, to find out the common ratio. Then after that, um, I want to cross multiply these two uh, fractions. So I'm having cos square theta on the left equals to 2 sine theta minus sine square theta. Okay, so to solve the equation, right, in terms of cos and sine, it's a bit hard for us. Uh. So what we need to do is that we try to change our equation become, uh, maybe try to make it become, we are only having one trigonal function. So if I have a look for all the terms here, right, it is um, quite easy for us to change the cos square, become something with sine square. So for cos square, I can change it become 1 minus sine square. Because we learned one identity earlier, right? What is the identity that we learned? We are having sine square plus cos square equals to 1. So cos square can be written as 1 minus sine square. Okay, so 1 minus sine square theta equals to 2 sine theta minus sine square theta again. Alright, then from here, I will see, I can see that, oh, basically I can simplify off the sine theta, and, oh, sorry, sine square theta and sine square theta. And I get a comparatively a simple equation where I'm having sine theta equals to half. Okay, so since they are asking for theta, which is in which is an acute angle, so I will take sine inverse half to find out my answer. Okay, so your theta will be basically 30 degree, and keep it into the radian form, it should be pi over 6, which is 30 degree, right? Yeah, so this is how we answer part A for this question. Okay, then after that, we go to part number mm, B. Okay, so for part number B, they are saying that by using this value of theta, right, find the sum of the first 10 terms. So they, we are interested to find S10. Okay, and then give the answer in the form of this pattern where B and C are the integers to be found. Alright, so to find out the sum of the first 10 terms in the geometric progression, I need a few information first. First one, I need the initial value or maybe the first term. What is the first term that we have? According to what is provided in the question just now, our first term is sine theta. So A will be equal to sine theta, which is sine, then pi over, which is 30 degree. So sine pi over 6 will give you the value half. Okay, then the second thing I need is the value of R, the common ratio. So according to our formula just now, if you want to get the common ratio R, you can take T2 divided by T1 or T3 divided by T2. 
So I'm using second divided by first term. Right? So cos theta divided by sine theta. Okay, so from here I'm using cos theta divided by sine theta. Okay, of course you can use the calculator to help you or you can do some manual calculation. Okay, according to what you understand. So cos pi over 6. Pi over 6 means 30 degree. So you're having square root 3 over 2. Sine 30 degree means half. So when you try to simplify, your R will be actually square root 3. Okay, so now you have the first term. You have the common ratio. So you can use them to find out the first sum of the first 10 terms. Okay, so what is the formula for sum of the first 10 terms? Again, okay, if you can't remember, then of course you can refer it to this one, the formula booklet, Sn equals to A, then 1 minus R power N divided by 1 minus R. Okay, so this is what we have. Lah. So you can actually try to apply this one. Okay, so let's see how can we continue from here. Okay, so if I want to have S10, so basically my formula is A, and then 1 minus r power 10 divided by 1 minus r. Okay, substituting the value, so I'm having half. A is a half, right? Then 1 minus square root 3 power 10 divided by 1 minus square root 3. Okay, so now basically you need to uh, simplify this term here. Okay, so when I take 1, okay, maybe you try to find a square root 3 power 10 first. Square root 3 power 10 will give you a value of 2, 4, 3. So you're having 1 minus 2, 4, 3 divided by 1 minus square root 3. Okay, so 1 minus 2, 4, 3 divided by half, divided by 2, sorry, divided by 2, you have negative 1 to 1. So negative 1 to 1 divided by 1 minus square root 3. Okay, so if you have a look for the question, right, they are asking for b divided by square root c minus 1. So I'm having a, a little bit different from what the question requests. So what I can do is I try to put the negative on top and multiply inside the bracket at the bottom. So when you multiply it to the two terms okay in the denominator so basically you have to answer pattern that they want you to show lah, where it will be actually one two one over square root three minus one okay so you double check again your answer here it actually fulfill what is requested by the question right because b and c are both integer so one to one is integer three is integer as well all right yeah so this is how we solve this question number five Okay, so now we are at question number six. All right, so um, we are given the equation of a curve, and this is a quadratic curve. They want us to find the coordinate of the maximum point of the curve. All right, so to find out, sorry, to find out the minimum point, uh, not maximum point. Okay, so to find out the minimum point, um, there are basically two different ways here. The first one is you can apply differentiation dy dx and you let it equal to zero, find the coordinate of x and y when dy dx equals to zero. Then another one is because this is a quadratic uh, equation, so if you want to find the minimum point, you can actually try to complete square it. So there are two different methods that you can apply here. Lah. All right, so for me, I'm using the completing square. So I'm having x squared minus 8x, so plus something square minus something square, then plus 5. So the something here will be the value b, which is negative 8 divided by 2. So I'm having a negative 4 here. And also negative 4. Okay, combine the first three terms, become a big bracket with square outside. So I'm having x minus 4 squared, then minus 16 and plus 5. Then if we try to further simplify it, we'll be having this one, negative 11. Right, so for this completed square form, basically you can straight away read the vertex, uh, the coordinate of the vertex directly from the equation here. So our coefficient of x squared is a right is one which is a positive value so we are having a u shape right so basically we are having a minimum point for this kind of curve since we already know that oh 
our vertex is a minimum point. So to read the coordinate of vertex, you can directly read it from here, where the minimum point coordinate will be x minus 4 equals to 0. So you get the value x equals to 4. And then for the value of y, you directly read it from the completing square form. So you're having negative 11. So the minimum point will be 4 and negative 11. Right, so if you want to apply differentiation, you let the dy dx equals to 0 also, can. so you'll be getting the same answer. Alright, so for me, here I'm trying to show only one answer, uh, one solution. Okay, then let's continue to part number b. For part number b, they are saying that the curve is stretched by a factor of 2 parallel to the y-axis. So a factor of 2 parallel, and the transformation is stretched, and then translated by 4, 1. And they want you to find the coordinate of the minimum point of the transform curve. So again, what how to find the minimum point of the transform curve? So first of all, my minimum point is 4 and negative 11, right? Okay, so the very first uh, transformation that we have uh, basically is a stretch in Y. Then the factor is 2, which means that the value of Y will be affected the value of x will not be affected because when there's a stretch in y, right, basically we pull the graph either longer, okay, or maybe compress it shorter, become shorter. So stretch in y with a factor 2 means that the y coordinate will need to multiply it by 2, okay? So x remains the same, which is 4, and then when you want to multiply the y coordinate by 2, so you're having negative 22. So after the first transformation, which is about the stretch, huh, our coordinate of minimum becomes something like this. And after that, we need to go through a translation, right? Okay, so for this translation, basically, they involve both directions. Where x, we are going to move it, x unit, 4 unit to the, to the right. 4 is 4 unit to the right. And then the 1 below means 1 unit going up. So when you bring it 4 unit to the right, that means uh, our x coordinate need to plus 4. So 4 plus 4, you get an 8. Alright, then for the value of y, you move up 1 unit. So that means negative 22, you need to plus 1. Because moving up, right? So you're having negative 21. Therefore, the final minimum point okay, after the transformation is 8 and negative 21. So this is how we solve it by using... Um, the minimum point as a reference, then you try slow, try slowly, okay, to change the coordinate accordingly, right? Okay, then let's continue to part C. Okay, so for part C here, they want you to find the equation of the transform curve, give the answer in the form of y equals to ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, c are integers to be found. Okay, uh, so there are basically uh, two different ways for you to solve it, uh. Okay, so first of all, right, um, to find the transform curve, transform curve. Okay, I know that my original, my equation goes through a stretch in y direction, followed by translation, right? So when I have a stretch in y direction, it's a 2. Then followed by the translation, you have to multiply 2 with the original function. And after that, translation in x, huh? Basically means you are moving it for you need to the left, but when you want to put it in the function form, function form right for transformation, it is having opposite direction. That means we are having minus four. Bring it into the basic uh, function, you should have x minus four, and then translation is one one unit going up. So that means you have to plus one outside the basic function. So this is the general formula for the transform curve. Okay. Alright, so uh, how to change the equation become the transform curve? So you can actually use your original equation or you can use your completed square form to transform the curve. Alright, so for me, I will show you the original first. Huh? So what's your, <coughs> what's your original f? Sorry, what's your original function? So let's say I assume that fx is the original function where it is equals to 8 square, sorry, x square minus 8x plus 5. So this is the original function, right? So if you already forget, you can have a look. This is our original function. Alright, then I want to transform it by using the following transformation here. 
which means that I'm going to take a 2, multiply a 2 in front of the basic function. All the x I have to change it become x minus 4 because of the translation. Okay, then plus 5, close bracket. Then you need to put a plus 1 outside the basic bracket, so plus 1. Okay, so of course, uh, for the final answer that they want you to show is ax squared plus bx plus c form, right? So you have to actually expand them. Okay, then multiply the two inside the bracket. Okay, and by right, you should be able to get this one. 2x squared minus 32x plus 107. Okay, so this is how we get the transform equation for the transform curve. Lah. Okay, and then the starting part is I'm using the original function before the transformation. Okay, then substitute and put it inside the transform formula and we get the final answer. Okay, then another method is some students, they might want to use a completing square form. Okay, to go through with the transformation, which is also can. Alright, so if let's say I show you the answer like this, uh, I'm having the completed square form, which is x minus 4 square minus 11, right? Yeah, so if you want to start by using the completed square form, also no problem at all, you can have a try. The final answer is actually the same. Okay, all right, so if let's say I'm having y, still the same transformation, right? Stretch in y direction, followed by the translation in x, which is 4 unit to the right, and also y, which is 1 unit going up. Okay, then if I start from my transform curve, Oh, sorry, if I start with my completed square form, originally x minus 4 square, right? So now you need to substitute x by using x minus 4. So it becomes x minus 8 square. Okay, then minus 11, then plus 1. Okay, then again, definitely you need to expand it because the final answer should be ax squared plus bx plus c. Right, so you have to expand it. Okay, then I'm having negative 22 plus 1. And if I try to simplify and expand this whole thing, right? Okay, you will able to see that our answer are actually the same. So no matter you start from original function or you can start from the completed square form, they'll give you the same answer if your transformation is the correct one All right okay yeah so this is how we solve um, this question number six okay so question number seven they want us to verify this identity okay so um for me i'll start from left hand side to prove the identity i will start from the left hand side mm, because to me i think expansion is easier than factorization so i will start from left hand side to expand it so i'm having 2x minus 1 and then for x squared plus 2x minus 1. Okay, expand every term slowly here. So you should have 8x power 3. Then for x squared, negative 2x minus 4x squared minus 2x plus 1. Okay, then if I just try to further simplify it, right? Basically, I will get the identity that they want us to show on the right-hand side. Okay, so you can start from left to right or right to left, up to you. Okay, so basically, in my opinion, expansion will be easier than the factorization. So I, that's why I start from the left hand side. All right, then after that, for part number B, again, still proving, they want to prove the identity for this one. Okay, so um, again, for me personally, I will start from the left hand side. It is because of comparatively like i will feel the left hand side is a more complicated expression because we are having tangent that we can change it become sine and cos but for the expression on the right hand side basically you look like they are quite simple like. we are having very basic trigo which is a cos all right so to me i think starting from left hand side which is a more complicated side is easier so i will start from left hand side again 
for tangent square plus 1 divided by tangent square minus 1, right? I will change it become sine square divided by cos square. Because as what we know, tangent equals to sine of cos. So tangent square equals to sine square over cos square. Same thing happened for the denominator. Okay, and after that, to get rid of the, de uh, the denominator with cos square theta, yeah? So I have to multiply the top, multiply the top with cos square theta. The bottom also the same thing, so that your uh, expression is a balanced expression uh, when you do any adjustment here. So I also multiply the denominator with cos square theta. So if I multiply them, I will have sine square theta plus cos square theta divided by sine square theta minus cos square theta. Okay, so for the numerator, right, cos square plus sine square equals to 1 because we learned the um, identity earlier, which is sine square plus cos square equals to 1. And then for the denominator, right, we need to do a little bit of adjustment so that I can get something with only cos. So you can see that our that denominator in the answer, they only show us something with the cos square, right? Which means that we need to further simplify the sine square in our solution become cos square. So I think it is quite straightforward also. We are going to use the identity where sine square plus cos square equals to 1. And that gives you sine square equals to 1 minus cos square. Okay, so we are going to substitute it now. Okay, so numerator become 1. The sine square theta I will make become 1 minus cos square theta. <clears throat> then minus cos square theta. And this is how you get the answer that you want to show on the <clears throat> right hand side. So we are having 1 divided by 1 minus 2 cos square theta. So this is what we have for part number B. And let's have a look for part C. Then now for part C, uh, by using the result of A and B, they want you to solve this particular equation. And then the theta is for the value between 0 and 180. Okay, so let's start from the equation given first. I'm having tangent square plus 1 divided by tangent square minus 1 equals to 4 cos theta. Okay, so for the left-hand side expression here, I'm going to use the result in part B, where tangent square plus 1 divided by tangent square minus 1 can be written as 1 over 1 minus 2 cos square theta. That equals to 4 cos theta. And now to further solve this equation, I will want to bring the denominator to the right-hand side become multiplied. So I'm having 4 cos theta minus 8 cos cube theta. Okay, if I try to rephrase my equation again, we should have something like this. Huh? Okay, so I want you to compare this particular equation right with the result in part number one. So result in part number one, we actually have, have something like this. Huh? 8x power 3 minus 4x plus 1 can be written as the factorized one. 2x minus 1, then 4x squared plus 2x plus minus 1, right? Okay, so this is basically what we have in part number 1. So if you try to compare, right, our cos cube equation with this one, basically they are having the same pattern. So that means by substituting the x become the cos theta, you can factorize them become this bracket. Alright, so this is by using the result in part number 1. So I further solve my equation here. So I factorize it, I should have 2 cos theta minus 1. And after that, 4 cos square theta plus 2 cos theta mm, minus 1 equals to 0. So you're using the part 1 result, right? And substitute the x become the cos theta and you can further simplify it. Alright, so from here we're having two parts of equation. The first one is this one where I'm having cos theta equals to half. So when you try to find the theta, it should be cos inverse half. Huh? So cos inverse half means 60 degree. 60 degree should be 
uh, they want us to put our answer in the degree form, right? Yeah, so 60B is the answer, one of the answer. Okay, then for this part, theta, I think this equation cannot be solved by using uh, factorization anymore. So what can we do here is we try to use the quadratic formula, right, to get the root to get a value for the cos theta. So I'm having negative b, so negative b plus minus b square minus 4 ac. So 2 square minus 4, your a is a 4, your c is negative 1 divided by 2a. So you're having 2 times 4. Okay, and then by right you should have two answer for the cos theta. Okay, so for cos theta, if you press calculator and after you substitute the value here for the quadratic formula, by right, one of your cos theta is equal to 0 0.3090169944. Okay, and then the other value for cos theta will be negative 0 0.8090169944. Okay. Then for this particular equation, I try to find out the angle. Basic angle is 72. And then this is positive, right? Alright, and then they only want us to consider the theta in the first two quadrants. So for cos theta equals to a positive value, the only first quadrant is having this correct result. So it will be 72. Okay, then for the next value here, if I try to find the basic angle, it should be 36 degree. Basic angle is 36. And then because we are looking for the answer for the quadrant, uh, answer from the quadrant where cos is negative, so it belongs to quadrant number 2. To get the answer for quadrant number 2, you need to take 180 minus the basic angle. So the basic angle that we get just now is 36. Alright, so from here we are having theta equals to 144. Okay, so summarize our answer here. We are basically having three different answers for the theta. Theta equals to 60. Theta equals to 72 and also 144. So usually for me, I will just write out again uh, to summarize all my answer here. I'm having 60, 72 and also 144. Okay, so this is how we basically solve the question number 7. Okay, so question number 8. Um, we are given function f and g and they are defined uh, in this way. Then A is a positive constant. So A must be a positive value. Eh? Right, so first they want us to find the expression for F inverse X. Okay, so to find out the F inverse X, we will let Y equals to Fx first. Okay, so to find the F inverse, I want to rephrase this whole equation become X equals to something something Y. X in terms of Y. Alright, so I'm having X plus A equals to plus minus square root of y plus a. I move the negative a over, then you take square root. So when you take square root by yourself, I have to include both plus and minus sign. Okay, then after that, I'm having x equals to negative a plus minus square root y plus a. Okay, so you want to find out the inverse function, right? You cannot have two answers as the inverse function. You must choose only one equation. So for our solution here, basically we are having two. The first one is negative a plus square root of something and then negative a minus square root of something so between these two functions right i have to choose only one of them to be the correct inverse function so usually how are you going to choose it choose the correct inverse function basically the equation that we have here right is the f inverse ma. we need to decide which one is the correct f inverse and basically the equation for the f inverse means the range of f inverse so the range of f inverse basically is the same as the domain of the inverse. Oh, sorry, the domain of the original function. So the domain of the original function is this one, x smaller equals to negative a. So you have to ask yourself, which of the equation here will eventually give you a value that is smaller equals to negative a. So when I'm having negative a plus something, right, the value that I get definitely will be more than negative a. So this doesn't fulfill what we have in the domain of the original function and then if i'm having negative a minus square root of something negative a minus something it is always less than negative a so that means this is the correct inverse function that i should have 
so that it actually tally with what we have in the domain of the original function. Right? Okay. So from here, this is how we decide. Lah. Our correct inverse function will be negative a then minus square root x plus a. Okay, so you need a little bit of technique lah, to decide which is the correct inverse function for this part. Right? Okay, then let's continue to part number b. Okay, for part b, they want us to state the domain of f inverse and also the range of f inverse. Okay, so again, just a very quick recall. When we are having the function f, right? Okay, so the starting set we call as domain of f. The ending set we call as the range of f. And if let's say we are trying to have an inverse function, so you can see that for the inverse function, right? The domain of the inverse function will be at this side and then the range of the inverse function will be at the other side here. It's a, a reverse function. Okay, the reverse way. Lah. So you can see that from the diagram that we draw, the arrow diagram that we draw, you can see that, oh, actually the domain of the original function is, at, is sharing the same set of the range of the inverse function. Then for this one, the range of the inverse function basically is also the same as the domain of the inverse function. So now, if they want us to state the domain of the function f, inverse domain of the inverse function is equals to the range of the function okay and how can i know what is the range of the function so i go back to the original function here this one they already put the function in the completed square form right so for this one, I actually can know the vertex, the coordinate of the vertex for this function. So the coordinate is negative a and negative a. Which means that this negative a and negative a uh, is actually a minimum value or minimum point. So let's say this is negative a. This one is also a negative a. So your curve may be passed through something like this. Uh. So I just simply sketch, alright? It is not a um, accurate one. So this one should be your function, alright? Okay, so from the function here, you can see very clearly that what is the range for this function? Uh? The range is actually y greater equals to negative a, right? Okay, since we already know that the range of the original function is y greater equals to negative a, so the domain of the inverse function also the same. Therefore, when I want to write out the domain of inverse function, you should change the y become the x. Uh? So x greater equals to negative a. This is how we decide actually. Okay. And now they want us to stage, state the range of the function inverse. So if let's say the range of the inverse function should be equal to the domain of the function. And I think this one is very straightforward because the domain of the function is already provided in our question here. x smaller equals to negative a. So you just need to change it become y. So x smaller equals to negative a, you just change it become y so that it belongs to it denotes the range of the inverse function. So y smaller equals to negative a. Okay, so this is how we actually um, decide lah, okay, or determine what is the domain and range of the inverse function. Alright, then now for part number c. Now they are telling us that a is equal to 7 over 2. They want us to solve the equation gfx equals to 0. Okay, if I try to write out my equation again, uh, what is my function fx again? So my function fx basically is x plus 7 over 2 because now a is 7 over 2, right? So 7 over 2 uh, square minus 7 over 2 because it is x plus a square minus a. So my function fx looks something like this now and it should be x smaller equals to uh, 7 over 2. I think negative 7 over 2, negative a, right? Yeah, so it should be negative 7 over 2, the domain. Okay, right, then this is my function fx. Ah. Then what is my function g? So the g is actually, if you want to rewrite again, it should be 2x minus 1. Okay, if you can't re remember, you go back here to have a look, 2x minus 1. Okay. Then now, they want us to solve the equation g f x equals to 0. So let's start. Okay, so this is a composite function. That means that I want to substitute f x into my g. So my f x is this one, the completed square form. 
equals to zero. So I substitute the function fx into the function g, which means that I need to substitute the x by using the function f. So I'm having two, then copy in the function f. Okay, then minus one equals to zero. So this is basically the composite function. Alright, so if I try to move everything over, right? Because I try to get the value for x. Huh? So if I try to move everything over, I'm having 1 over 2 for this case. Then x plus 7 over 2 squared equals to 8 over 2, which is a 4. Alright, then from here, you can try to solve for the equation and get the an answer. So I will have x plus plus 7 over 2. When you take square root here, you need to consider both plus and minus sign. So you're having x plus 7 over 2 equals to 2 and also x plus 7 over 2 equals to negative 2. Okay, then after that, what are the values that I will get here? Okay, so I'll get 2 minus 7 over 2 which is negative 3 over 2 for this case and also x equals to negative 2 minus 7 over 2, it will be negative 11 over 2. And basically, we only accept the answer where x equals to negative 11 over 2. And we will ignore the part where x equals to negative 3 over 2. Anyone know what is the reason that I ignore negative 3 over 2 or not? Okay, so again, uh, it still uh, related to our function, the domain range of the function. So something different is for well, this function, okay, so basically we are having composite function. Uh. So the first function go through is f, after that followed by the g. So this whole thing basically means the composite function gf, right? So you can see that the composite function gf, uh, the domain of the composite function gf is also part of the domain of the f. Okay, and since our domain of the x already tells us that x must be smaller than negative 7 over 2, so between these two answers, I only choose the value that fulfilled our domain here, where it should be negative 11 over 2, and that's why we ignore negative 3 over 2 here. Alright, so you need to be um, very careful about all the domain range, uh, especially in this, in this kind of question. You need to know uh, to check for the final answer, which is the correct final answer, with the domain given, okay, before you uh, conclude your answer, okay? Right, so this is how we solve question number eight. Okay, so we are now at question number nine. Uh, they, we are having a diagram here, and then there are two curves given. Right, so first curve and second curve. The curve intersect at the point A and B. All right, then for the first question, they want us to find the coordinates of A and B. So since A and B is the are the intersection point for the two curve, right? So to find the intersection point, basically we need to solve the equation simultaneously. All right, and then for this question, they are interested to find out the coordinates for A and B. Right? That means we should include both um, X coordinate and also Y coordinate for the two points here, right? Okay, so to solve the equation simultaneously, you'll let equation number one, which is this one, 2x power half, okay, then plus 13 over square root x, so I will put it as 13 over square root x or x power half, half equals to 3 over x power half plus 12. Okay, so this is what we have. And then uh, if I want to solve the equation simultaneously, right, I don't like to have the denominator here, so I will want to make it disappear. To make it disappear, what I need to do is like, um, I have to multiply the whole equation with x power half or the square root x. If I multiply the whole equation with x power half or square root x, then I will have something like this. Huh? x power half multiplied by x power half, you have x power 1. Then 13 over x power half multiplied by x power half, you have 13 only. Right? Then this one also, I'm having the 3 here. Then plus 12 x power half. Okay, so rephrase the equation. something like this and then you can further simplify it become x minus 6 x power half plus 5 equals to 10 oh sorry equals to 0 all right so from here 
Uh, I don't whether what well, I am not sure whether you can see or not. Yeah, basically it belongs to a quadratic form equation. If you cannot see it clearly, you actually can let y equals to x power half. Therefore, your equation will look something like this. Uh. So x power one, right, is actually x power half square. X power half square, right, which is x power one. So the x power half here, I can actually change become the y. So I'm having y square minus six y then plus 5 equals to 0. So I think from here you can see very clearly that it belongs to a quadratic form equation. So you can continue from here to factorize it if you want. So for me, I will just continue with the square root of x. Ah. Right, so if I try to factorize this one, I'm having square root x and square root x. And I should have minus 5, then minus 1, so that I get negative 6. Then I'm having two values for square root x here, x equals to, uh, square root x equals to 1, and also square root x equals to 5. Then take the square for both sides. I'm having 1, and then x equals to 24. Okay, so after I get the x coordinate for the uh, intersection point, I also need to get the y coordinate. So to get the y coordinate, substitute x equals to 1 into either one of these two equations, either one only, right? So basically, you'll get the same answer, right? So for me, I will substitute it into this one, which is, to me, is easier. Right, so substitute 1 inside here. So you're having 3 plus 12, which is a 15. Then if you substitute 25 into this part, you are having 3 over 5. 3 over 5 plus 12, and you should have 63 over 5. Okay, then from the diagram, because I know that A is actually uh, at the, in front, okay, closer to the, y axis, therefore the x coordinate for the a should be smaller, the x coordinate for the b should be larger. And from here, I know that the coordinate for a should be 1 and 15, then the coordinate for b should be 25 and also 63 over 5. Okay, so basically this is how we solve this question number 9 and a. Then now let's proceed to part number B. Okay, so for part number B, they want us to find the area of the shaded region. Right, so if we go back to the diagram here, basically you can see that the shaded area, right, is bounded by the two curve. So the curve on top is this one, okay, which is 3x power negative half plus 12, and then the curve at the bottom is this one. Okay, so when I want to find the area, I, have to, <coughs> I will take the um curve on top minus the curve at the bottom to get the area on top okay the whole area for the curve on top minus the whole area at the curve at the bottom so you get the shaded area that we have and the limit of the area is bounded by the x coordinate for a and also the x coordinate for b all right so let's set up the question now <clears throat> okay <coughs> excuse me to find the area what we need to do is we want to integrate x equals to the x coordinate for the a is 1 and then the x coordinate for the b is 25. Then the area, the curve on top, just now we already can see that it is 3x power negative half plus 12 minus the curve at the bottom. So the curve at the bottom is x 2x power half, okay, then plus 13x power negative half. Okay, so all these are that you can direct integrate every single term here. 3 is a constant, you just copy, and then the power plus 1 become half, divided by the new power. For the 12, you integrate 12, a constant, you get 12x. And then, um, what else do I have? Then for this one, Okay, so I will take, I will multiply the negative in, 2 in, alright, so negative 2, 2 is a constant, power plus 1 becomes 3 over 2, divided by a new power, 3 over 2, minus 13, I copy, x power negative half, the power plus 1 becomes positive half, divided by the new power half. Oh, sorry, I already start the integration, right, so the sign that I put here should be a square bracket with the limit. Okay, because I already started the integration, all right? So there should be no more integration sign. It should be substituted by a limit now. 
okay uh so before i try to substitute all the value right what i prefer to do is like um i usually tends to simplify all the um uh, constant first so three over half three over half you get a six then plus 12x then for this one 2 divided by 2 uh, 3 over 2 you're having 4 over 3 then for this one, I'm having 26 okay and after that I can see that these two terms are having the same power of x right so I will just group them together so 6 minus 20 negative 26 you're having negative 20 so if I rephrase my equation again my expression again this is something that I will have uh. okay so minus 20 then x power half then usually I simplify everything only I tends to substitute in the limit uh, to make my steps looks more how to say I'm um, not so complicated all right substitute 25 okay inside the equation here so I'm having 12 multiplied with 25 so I'm having 300 25 substitute in here so it takes square root 25 which is a 5 then 5 power 3 times 4 divided by 3 so you're having negative 500 over 3 here you're having 20 times 5 20 times 5 should be 100 okay then minus now I want to substitute the value of 1 substitute 1 here you get 12 Substitute 1, you have negative 4 over 3. Substitute 1, you are having negative 20. Okay, so if you try to simplify all your answer carefully, by right, you should have the answer 1, 2, 8 over 3. Okay, in a fraction form, if you want, you can change to become uh, 3 significant figure if you want. All right, so for me, I will just keep it as a fraction here. Okay, so this is how we solve question number 9. Okay, so question number 10. We are having um, this function. Okay, they want us to find the x coordinate of the stationary point. So I have the keyword stationary point. So to find the stationary point, what we need to do is like we need to find out the f prime x and we let it equal to 0. Then from f prime x equals to 0, we try to find the x coordinate. Uh, Alright, then they actually want us to determine the nature. We have to decide whether the points are our maximum point or minimum point. Okay, so let's start. We are having the function fx, which is equals to this one. Okay, so to find out f prime x, which is the differentiation. Okay, so for the first term, you're having a power with the bracket. So the differentiation step is you pull the power in front, become 5 over 3, copy the bracket power minus 1 become 2 over 3 then you need to multiply the term with the differentiation of the bracket inside so differentiate 4x minus 3 you get 4 so you have to multiply with a 4 then minus differentiate 20 over 3x then basically you're having the constant 20 over 3 all right then um i want to find out the x coordinate for the stationary point right so i have to let it become zero multiply all the constant together first okay then to find the value of x what am i going to do is like i'm trying to move all the term to the other side slowly uh to the other side slowly right so i'm having this one equals to 20 over 3 and then 4x minus 3 power 2 over 3 equals to 1 okay and then how can i simplify and make the power disappear so i'm having 4x minus 3 i need to have a 1 with the power 3 over 2 but when you want to have the power 3 over 2 right okay 1 power 3 over 2 basically it means that you should have a uh, square root 1 when you want to take the square root 1 you should consider the plus and minus sign because you take the square root by itself Alright, so the power half basically is plus minus square root 1. After that, only you need to power, uh, power 3. Okay, so when you have plus minus square root 1 power 3, right? Your answer will have two answers here, which is 1 and also negative 1. So please take note on this part. 
uh, I believe that quite a number of students will actually not aware of this. Uh. Okay, when you want to take the power 3 over 2, basically you it, it involves the square root. So when you want to take the square root by yourself, you have to include the plus and minus sign. Okay, All right. So here I will put a plus minus 1 here. Which means that your solution here, I'm having, you're having 4x minus 3 equals to 1. 4x minus 3 equals to negative 1. Okay, then try to simplify the answer. So by right, you should have x equals to 1 and also x equals to half. Okay, so these are the x coordinate for the stationary point. So we already settled the x coordinate part. And now let's continue to determine the nature. Alright, so to determine the nature, either you can try to investigate the sign of the dy dx or the sign of the fx before and after the stationary point. That's the first method. Or the other method is you can try to find the second derivative or second differentiation. Second differentiation. So second differentiation is start from this one. This this diff, the f prime x here. Okay, this is my f prime x, right? So differentiate this one, power I put in front. That means I'm having 20 over 3. Multiply with the power which is 2 over 3. Copy the bracket, power minus 1 become negative 1 over 3. And now you need to differentiate the thing inside the bracket which is a 4 and you multiply with the 4. Alright, and we can try to um, simplify this whole thing here. And we will be having 1, 6, 0 over 9. Then multiply with 4x minus 3, power negative 1 over 3. Alright, and now to further determine the nature of the point, right, you need to investigate what is the value for f prime, uh, the, the second derivative uh, at each single value here. Alright, so when x equals to half, what is the value of f prime prime x? So the f prime prime half is actually equals to negative 169, 160 over 9, which is a negative value. So for this negative value, basically the curve is having a maximum point. So it has a maximum point. Okay, and x equals to half. Okay, so that means for this particular point here, the stationary point, it is actually a maximum point. And we are doing the same thing for x equals to 1. So when x equals to 1, we substitute in the value, our f prime prime 1, the value that we get is actually 160 over 9. Okay, which is greater than 0. Okay, so again, now you substitute it here, x equals to 1, then this is basically what you get. Lah. So when your f prime prime x is greater than zero positive, basically the curve has a minimum point at this value of x. So it has a minimum point at x equals to one. Okay, so this is how we actually determine the stationary point and also the nature of this point, right? Okay, so let's continue to part number B. Okay, so for part B, they want us to state the set of value for which the function is increasing. Okay, so they just want to state that. Uh, so basically, we need to imagine a little bit uh, about the curve. How, how will the curve look like? Okay, so just now at x equals to half, right? In part number one, uh, part A. When x equals to half, we know that it is a maximum point. And then when x equals to 1, we know that it is a minimum point. We, which means that if you try to imagine, yeah, let's say this is the maximum point. Let's say this is x equals to 1. Uh, oh, sorry, x equals to half. Uh, right? Because this is a mini maximum point, right? Therefore, uh, the curve uh, should look something like this. So that at x equals to half, you are having the maximum point. And then when x equals to 1, you are having a minimum point. So that means if, let's say, this is a x equals to 1, let's say, okay? So the minimum point will look something like this. So the x equals to 1 equals to a minimum point. Okay, so basically this is the general shape that you might have for this function. And since this question is asking for increasing function, 
So increasing function means that the function become higher and higher, right? From left to the right. So the highlighted part here will be the increasing function. This part is also the increasing function, become higher and higher. So to get uh, when is the value of x, uh, when we're having an increasing function, eh? so this part of the value is x smaller than half. Okay, and then this part of the graph will be equals to x greater than 1. So between uh, when x smaller than half and also x greater than 1, the function is increasing. So you can just investigate or try to find out by using the maximum and minimum point that we got just now. Alright, so this is how we refer and get the conclusion for this question. Right? Okay, so this is how we solve question. Okay, so we are now at the very last uh, question for this paper. Um, we are having the coordinate A, B, and C, and then um, you can see that there's a value P that we don't know, like, right? And AB is perpendicular to the line BC. Alright, so this is the main information that we are going to use it now. Given that P is smaller than 0, find the value of P. So, um, since radian, since the line AB is per perpendicular to the line BC, right? When they are perpendicular to each other, you should know that the gradient of each line, uh, when we multiply them together, it should be equal to negative 1. So this is one small uh, information that you need to know, uh, or small, one small concept that you need to know. Okay, when two lines are perpendicular to each other, when you multiply their gradient together, it should be equal to negative 1. Alright, so I try to find the uh, the gradient of AB first. To find the gradient of AB, formula is y1 minus y2 divided by x1 minus x2. So you can take 7 minus 4. y1 maybe can be the point B, uh, right? 7 minus 4, then P minus 6. Or you want to do it the other way around also can. 4 minus 7, 6 minus P. Right. Then for the BC, to calculate the gradient, I take 18 minus 7. Okay, divided by 14 minus P. And it is equals to negative 1. Okay, so if I try to um, make the denominator disappear, right, I want to bring all the term or maybe all the expression at the denominator, bring it to the right hand side. So that I'm having 3 multiplied with 18 minus 7 is 11, then having negative p minus 6, and then 14 minus p. Okay, so basically, right, to get the value for P, what we need to do is, like, we just try to uh, simplify, expand and simplify everything. Okay, so for this one, I'm having P minus 6, then P minus 14, and I want to expand them. If I expand it correctly, if you expand it correctly without any careless mistake uh, by right after simplify the terms you should have a quadratic equation so this is a quadratic equation that you get and if can try to factorize it as well so we are we want to have negative 20p so negative 20 51 is up 17 and 3 right so i'm having negative 17 minus 3 and from here we are having the answer p equals to 3. Okay. Then p equals to 70 is ignored. Why? Because um, in the question itself, they did mention that p must be smaller than 0. Ah, uh, sorry, smaller than 10, right? So we only accept this one answer here, which is p equals to 3. All right. Okay, then let's continue to part number b. Okay, uh, for part number B, there's a circle pass through the point A, B, and C. Find the equation of the circle. Alright, so uh, when there's a circle pass through the point A, B, and C, right? Um, maybe what can we try to consider is we are actually having A, B, and also the line B, C is perpendicular to each other. Okay, and then... If I have AB and BC perpendicular to each other, and then 
the triangle formed by the point ABC in a circle, right? By right, one of the sides should be the diameter of the circle. There's another property between the circle and triangle also where you need to know that if I have any triangle, okay, with one of the side pass through the diameter, okay, and it is lies inside the circle, then basically this triangle will be having a 90 degree, okay, at this angle. So this is some, some uh, a property that we learned earlier, right? And since uh, you know that this is 90 degree, right? And then we, if we are having ABC of all three on the circumference, then what it does it means is we might have the A here, and then we'll have the B here, and we'll have the C here. So that if we feel the two, uh, the property that we learned just now, and also the result that we proved just now, okay? If I put ABC, on the circle, pass, the circle pass through the point ABC and at the same time AB and BC are 90 degrees then definitely AC must be the circle, the, the diameter of the circle and to form the equation of circle, I need two important information here the first one is the center, the second one is the radius alright, so how to find the center of the circle so you can see that center of the circle, since AC is diameter, right? so the center of the circle will be midpoint of AC okay, so how to get the midpoint of AC so you just add the X and X together divided by 2 then Y and Y together divided by 2 so X plus X divided by 2 then Y plus Y divided by 2 okay so you have 10 and also 11 Right, this is the center and then we need the radius so to find the radius right there are, what we can do is that you can try to find out the distance between AC and then divide it by 2 or you can find out the distance between A to the center also can since we already have the center here all right so um, it's up to you which one you want to use so for me I'm using AC divided by 2 okay so as a formula for the, what's the length formula between the two points or distance formula between the two points? I want to find the distance of AC, right? So it will be X minus X. Oh, sorry. Uh, maybe I should put it like this. Okay, so I will have X minus X squared. So X minus X squared. And then plus Y minus Y squared. So Y minus Y squared divided by 2. Okay, then when you total up all the values on top, it should be 260 divided by 2. Then we, if you don't have any ES calculator, right, you are using MS1, maybe you can learn how to simplify it in the third form. So it will become 4 times 65 divided by 2. So square root 4 can be simplified as a 2. So 2 divided 2, you get a, you can cancel it off. Therefore, your radius should be square root 65. Okay, so since we already have all the information needed, we have the center, we have the radius, so we can straight away write out the equation of the circle. So equation of circle, it will be equals to x minus the center, the coordinate square, plus y minus the y coordinate square equals to square root 65 square. So basically, if you... If you want, you can expand it, alright? Then for me, I will just keep it in this form. Then I will have 65. Okay, so this is how we form the equation of the circle. Alright, then after that for part number C, they want us to find the equation of the tangent to the circle as C, giving that, uh, giving the answer in the form of dx plus ey plus f equals to zero, where all these in uh, all these unknown df are integers. Right. So again, <coughs> to find out the gradient of tangent, right? Okay. So to find the gradient of tangent, let's go back to our diagram here. 
you want to find the tangent, the equation of tangent at point C. So let's say it's this one. Okay, so this is the gradient of tangent at point C. And we know that another property that we have is any tangent on the circle at a certain point, right? They are always perpendicular to the point, to the line of the point to the center. So that means of AC, the line AC and the tangent are perpendicular to each other. Okay, so this is another property that you need to know. Okay, right. So since we already know that the, the gradient of tangent is perpendicular to CA, so you can use the idea to find the gradient of tangent, then the passing point will be the point C. So when you want to form the equation, you need two things also. The first one is the gradient again. The second one is the passing point, right? For the line. So the passing point for the line is point C because the line passes through the point C. Man. Okay, so um, you need to further find out the M first before you can write out the equation. Okay, right. So let's continue from here. Okay, so I know that the gradient of tangent multiply with the gradient of AC or CA should be equals to negative 1. And what is the gradient of AC? By right, you should already find out just now in part number 1, right? So I write it out again. Y minus Y1 divided by X minus X1 equals to negative 1. So simplify this whole equation. By right, you should get the gradient of tangent equals to negative 4 over 7. Okay, and then what's the passing point? What's the coordinate for the C? So the coordinate for the C is 14 and 18. Right, so we are having the gradient, we have the passing point, so we can form the equation, basically. So to form the equation of tangent, there are many ways that you can form. Okay, you can use the equation y equals to mx plus c, substitute the y, substitute m, substitute x, get the c, then we write the equation again. Or you can try to use this general formula, y minus y1 equals to m, x minus x1. So basically for me, I'm using the second one, right? Okay, so I have the gradient and I have the coordinate. So I'm having y minus y coordinate, which is 18, equals to m. m is gradient, negative 4 over 7, then x minus x1. So x1 is 14. Alright, so if I try to simplify it, I will have negative 4 over 7x plus 26. And because now I want to uh, rephrase my answer into the form that the question 1, so I multiply 7 to the whole equation so that my denominator disappears. So I'm having negative 4x, then plus 182. Rephrase my equation again, I'm having 4x plus 7y minus 182 equals to 0. Because they want us to um, rephrase this one, right? The equation into the form of uh, dx plus ey plus f equals to 0. So this is a pattern that we need to show. Right? <laughs> okay, so this is how we solve this question number 11. And thank you very much for watching this video.